unresolved questions still surrounding the eventual route of Highway 1 through the Fred Highway Pass. But he was also told by local politicians they don't want that to be done with Federal Highway Pass, fearing that might rely on the Pass West of the line. As with the whole question, the route of Highway 1 is to take some care on giving a firm answer on the future of Thomas Street. Well, uh, Thomas Street uh, it's a very, it's a very important road, but uh, I'm not going to commit the department or myself to uh, the future plans of the area until the, uh, until the termination of the exhibition of the EINS proposals, which are at present uh, available, which are present on exhibition. In spite of the minister's comments, DMR officials said they could see no option for six-lane Thomas Street. Unless, to quote one, it was the do nothing. However, while Highway 1 is yet to be resolved, Mr. Jackson did say there would be a start soon on Roadway 3, the urban bypass which runs through Desmond. There are still a couple of properties to be acquired, and I'll be advising my colleague, the Minister for the Treasurer, Mr. Booth, and Mr. Jones, the member for Waratah within a few weeks uh, what the exact plans are for the uh, for the upgrading and the uh, completion of, uh, of uh, motorway 23. As well as the village 80 kilometres north of Newcastle, there are towns of Stroud in Canada, the United States and England, all sharing a common interest in hurling bricks and rolling pins. The international competition is the local Stroud's biggest day of the year, with visitors crowding in for a carnival. And now, push! Push! Amongst the special displays, there was a spectacular alternative to throwing bricks. Smashing tiles is the specialty of these Taekwondo members. But what the Stroud men really need to know is how to block a flying rolling pin. The ladies of the town showed they've really mastered this martial art. For the men, the Stroud challenge involves hurling these specially made two and a quarter kilogram bricks. The champs in the business take the competition very seriously. In the international competition, Barry Guest of Wingham was Australia's top competitor with a throw of 114 feet 10 inches while Pauline Gorton topped the rolling pin throwing with 122 feet 6 inches.
the British Airways, the British Sikorsky, Airways 61, 61 helicopter, helicopter was on a special flight from Penzance in Cornwall, Penzance in Cornwall to the island of St Mary's, of St. Mary's, in, the Mary's in the Silly Isles. Earlier scheduled Earlier flights, scheduled to, the flights island to the Holiday had Island had been cancelled because, because of heavy fog. The aircraft crashed, the aircraft into, the crashed into the sea as it approached St Mary's Airport, breaking up and sinking in 60 metres of water. The pilot of the rescue helicopter which picked up the survivors said the fog was very thick with extremely low visibility. Um, very, very foggy indeed. The sea was calm, not very much wind, uh, just a couple of miles off the coast in fact, and for some time we could actu actually see the coast, but um, on and off throughout it was quite foggy indeed. In fact, we passed over the top of a lifeboat without actually seeing it, and they fired flares to help us find them, but we didn't see them because of the fog. What did you see of the helicopter itself? When we eventually established ourselves, we could uh, see that there were two sponsons, uh, that's the landing gear, floating on the surface, along with fuel, oil, and the old bit of flotsam and jetsam, as you might expect. The two pilots were met by an ambulance when they were finally landed at St Mary's, although they were not seriously injured. One of the women's survivors was seriously hurt, and she was taken to hospital on the mainland. Royal Navy divers were winched down to the sea from rescue helicopters based at Cold Rose. months. With construction on the third Sydney ferry due to begin in August, today's announcement represents another shot in the arm for Carrington Slipways. General Manager of the company, Mr John Laverick, says work will begin on the Sydney Inner Harbour ferries which will service the Lane Cove and Parramatta River areas at the end of the year. Mr Laverick believes the job creation scheme, which was included in Carrington Slipways well, tender, I'd like to helped think bring that, uh, the contract to We were the most competitive, but I believe one of the major reasons was because we offered a job creation program in with our tender. How does this job creation program work? Well, it's part of the government's new proposals to uh, create job opportunities for young people and people who have been out of work for some time and this will offer the 25 people an opportunity to get work experience over the 17 week periods that the program involves. What does the contract mean to Carrington Slipways? Oh, it's, it's good news for us. It's a good follow on for our current work program. It allows us to continue with our developments if we plan a time ago and it gives us a good sense of uh, security and positive approach for the future. Like 
one of the problems we've had to come to grips with is, is has the is the state dockyard finished as a shipbuilding entity? And arising out of the discussions this morning, we believe not. Uh, we believe the dockyard has a future. We believe that there can be cooperation between the management and the unions to ensure uh, that that uh, is an achievable objective. But with the dockyard being out of shipbuilding for a certain time anyway, and with, for instance, Carrington Slipway surging ahead with, with contracts and also ideas to build even uh, aircraft carriers, couldn't we find the state dockyard that's so far behind it'll never ever catch up, never get back into things? I think that's a, a problem that we, we, we discussed this morning, and we believe that the, the yards must be seen as two separate entities. That uh, they build entirely two different types of vessels uh, of entirely different characteristics. Uh, we believe that the state dockyard, with the assistance of the state government that owns the state dockyard, and with the desire of the management over there to return the state dockyard to shipbuilding, uh, that they have the capacity to restore uh, to this town the ability to build ships uh, of a size that possibly Carrington can't cope with. Where do you go to from here? From here we go back to discussions, we're going to sit down, uh, no matter how long it takes us, to hammer out an agreement uh, which will constitute an agreement of, of common accord. Uh, from there we've got to go to the state government uh, to convince them that the dockyard management and the dockyard unions are working uh, in a cooperative manner. Uh, and from there I think it's also going to require some federal government input. The exhibition is called Modern Artists as Illustrators and is being shown at only two other galleries in Australia. Gallery director David Bradshaw says Newcastle will try to attract more international exhibitions in future. He outlines some coming attractions. It's a pretty exciting program. The next exhibition is a major Eric Wilson exhibition, which is a... Uh, Eric Wilson was famous in the 40s uh, for his painting. Uh, that's followed by... Uh, an international show of uh, the modern artist as a, an illustrator, which includes such famous people as Matisse and Cezanne. We have the Matara 10,000 Art Purchase Exhibition, which is composed of 25 invited Australian artists, followed by contemporary British drawings, um, which we're touring on behalf of the British Council, uh, very famous British artists. Uh, will be re represented in that show. The City Council has enlisted the help of Sergeant Anne Forth from the Police Rescue Squad, who's also officer in charge of the Disaster and Rescue Branch of Newcastle. He says huge quantities of dangerous goods are moved through the city, including cyanide. At any time, an accident could happen, but the city's industries have joined forces on Kurigang, where a large number of chemical industries are located. Here, The other companies will respond with some sort of assistance to deal with the problem. It's a mutual aid society which Sergeant Anforth believes puts us out in front. Yeah, not only have they a mutual aid system where they each hop in and help one another and uh, provide services to one another, they've all got behind the system and uh, they've uplifted their training programs with their drivers. And there are other people that are responsible and, and we expect to be responsible people outside cutting this stuff around. Self-help groups are good, but there is still more that needs to be done. Sergeant Anforth has told the city's aldermen that preventative measures should be upgraded with the emphasis placed on driver awareness and safety procedures. He also stresses that there are other areas which need to be looked at, such as the haulage of explosives. But as far as the haulage of dangerous chemical materials is concerned, rescue officials say this. It's unique. I don't know that it operates anywhere else in Australia, even though we have the highest uh, legislated standards as far as the requirements by law, the makeup of tankers and all these type of things, they're terribly high the standards required. But I don't know of anywhere else in Australia that has this type of program operating in New South Wales. But
The meeting was held in the town clerk's offices and it was attended by both the Newcastle Retail Fruit and Vegetable Merchants Association and the Chamber of Fruit and Vegetable Industries. On Monday, retailers blocked the movement of produce from the markets in protest over the sale of goods direct to the public. That issue, and a number of other problems, appear to have been sorted out at these talks last night. The Chamber offered to place an official full-time at the markets to remove unauthorised buyers if necessary. The public will only be allowed in on Fridays. And to ensure this, security is to be stepped up. The town clerk, Mr Barry Lewis, will also look at employing two more people to police the provisions of the ordinance, which will be reviewed to meet modern-day trends. The results of these talks will be put to a meeting of the traders today. The association has never had good facilities, according to officials who spoke at last night's function. The new courts have gradually taken shape on a site in front of the basketball stadium in Albert Street, Wickham. Much of it has been achieved through voluntary efforts, and funding was made available by both the council and the state government. The new courts will be the venue for the Australian Badminton Championships in September next year, something the association has dreamed of hosting for a long time. It's been a week of celebration at the new stadium. Former club members held a reunion. On hand to officially open the complex last night was the Lord Mayor, Alderman Joy Cummings. And uh, it's now my great pleasure to declare the Badminton Complex Stadium open. Guests were then treated to an exhibition match put on by members of the Newcastle Club who were also representatives of the under-18 state team. This is the shape the dinosaur is expected to be when all the bones have been pieced together. It was a flesh-eating animal. On its back legs it could have been anything up to 15 feet tall and weighing roughly two tons was half the size of a large elephant. Only a few bones were on show today. The first and most important find was this gigantic claw bone, the end bone from the animal's finger or toe. To give some idea of size, this talon is the same bone from a large eagle. The discovery was made in Surrey by an amateur collector. I noticed what I thought was fragments of broken dinosaur bone. And then close by I found this fragment of small claw, which in effect was in two and has since been joined together. That made me rather excited. And then a few feet away there was this lump of rock, I suppose, big as a large pineapple or rugby ball, um, with uh, that much of bone poking out as I thought. The team from the museum spent two months excavating the Surrey clay pit, a site being kept secret to deter souvenir hunters. Altogether they removed three van loads of bones. This is part of the skull. The three teeth in front are serrated just like steak knives. Remains of flesh-eating dinosaurs are extremely rare and this is something of a coup. The skeleton should be ready to join its relatives on public view next summer. City Council was among the in its absence from this meeting of the Association, which is considering its future. The members of the Council is needed if Mr. Uren's idea is to be followed up. It was suggested that they form a regional association of councils, similar to that which has been done in other areas, such as the western side of Sydney, which Mr. Uren believes has its act together and has greatly assisted his department by submitting a joint case for funding. I think that they got together as a collective body and then worked as a collective body, and I'm talking about a collective elected body, they represent the regions, 
then I think they can get on with the job, yes. Uh, everything's connected to everything else, and you cannot uh, isolate Newcastle from the Hunter Valley or vice versa. They've got to be interrelated to one another if they're going to work in the best interest uh, of the whole region and the people who live here. At the moment, Mr Uren's idea may have fallen on deaf ears. The Hunter Valley Local Government Association is not expected to meet, if at all, until after the local government elections in September. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's